John Stone. He's going to give us talk about a new disease in rheumatology, IgG4 related disease. Thank you. <clears throat> so, as interesting and as rewarding as ANCA associated vasculitis has been in my career, I have to say the most interesting thing that I have been involved in is IgG4 related disease. Um, this is a subject that came to my attention a little more than three years ago. And uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. And uh, I am delighted uh, to say that we're really just getting going in understanding this. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning is, first of all, I'm going to tell you what IgG4-related disease is. And then um, I'm going to talk about what it can tell us about the immune system, how the immune system works, and how rituximab works. Because you've heard a lot about rituximab, but I submit to you that we really don't know how it works in most or all of our diseases. And I think this fascinating disease can give us some very interesting insights. So um, I'm going to come back to this gentleman in a moment, and I'm going to tell you um, a lot about the, this disease in the context of um, a number of patients and their specific data. But I would just point out before I come back to this fellow, you can see his uh, left eye is obviously proptotic, and you can probably think of a lot of things, or several things anyway, uh, along the lines of rheumatic disease that this gentleman might have. And one of the points about IgG4-related disease is that it can really mimic a lot of our diseases, a lot of rheumatic diseases, and a lot of dis diseases that are otherwise immune-mediated. We'll come back to him. <clears throat> I want to start, though, with a 56-year-old Korean woman who had a PET scan that looked like this, and she had an interesting history. Not all of these things occurred at the same time, but she had neck swelling. She had had a pancreatic mass. She had mediastinal lymphadenopathy, and she had PET-positive hyalur nodes that you see here. So we rheumatologists do get involved in cases like this. After the infectious disease, people give up, and the oncologists decide that it's not a malignancy. <clears throat> so her history uh, was that in 2007, she had uh, presented with swollen cervical lymphadeno uh, lymphadenopathy. And um, these uh, uh, nodes, quote unquote nodes, underwent a biopsy at an outside hospital. And somehow it was not clear. Uh, somehow she had been diagnosed as having Sjogren's syndrome and rheumatoid arthritis. Then the next year she was seen by a very good rheumatologist and uh, he thought that she had very large firm uh, bilateral submandibular nodes left greater than right. And she was anti-Rho antibody positive by ELISA in a low titer. <clears throat> This is what she looked like. And one of my points about this is that we need to develop the right vocabulary because this is not lymphadenopathy. These are submandibular glands. Um, I made the same mistake when I first saw, when I saw my first patient with this disorder. And I have subsequently found that swollen submandibular glands are a hallmark of this disease. And when one sees swollen submandibular glands, as in this gentleman uh, or in this woman, uh, in the absence of other glandular swelling, this is very likely to be IgG4-related disease. In trying to understand my first patient uh, with this disorder, who, whom I'll tell you about in just a second, I came upon this picture in the medical literature. It was a, uh, from a paper from Sweden published in 1979. My first patient had been referred to me to rule out Sjogren's syndrome. And one of the many ironies of this condition was the fact that the uh, first author's last name was Sjogren. Um, as you can see, this patient is male. He needs a closer shave. Uh, but his neck looks just like the neck of the other patients that I showed you. 1979. I also came upon this paper from the German medical literature, 
1890.